<clears throat> right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. Uh, we'll continue with learning about living fossils today, and then if we have time, we'll move on to Lesson 11, uh, which is on explosion. Um, so if you were not here last week, there's a handout for... Less than 10, it says loving fossils, but living fossils. Um, so you'll need that one. We'll finish that one up. We didn't finish that lesson last time. So we'll finish that one and continue on with lesson 11 if we have time <clears throat> and start learning about the explosion. Uh, before we do that, though, um, let's uh, review those who are in need of our prayers. Uh, so Brother Larry had um, an appointment recently. Not sure that went. Um, how'd that go, brother? Uh, the neurosurgeon told me that actually. Okay. Okay, good. Right. Okay. All right, good. So, um, some encouraging news with Brother Larry that um, most likely the tumor is not is non cancerous. Um, so no surgeries are needed right now at this time. So let's continue to keep him, keep him in our prayers. Um, Brother Terry's friend, Dan Wendell, who's battling cancer. Sue Robinson, who is Tracy Taylor's mom, has cancer. Um, Ashley Compton was swelling on her brain, spinal, spinal column. Um, and then Brother um, David Weehy, Brother Stan, and Sister Helen also battling cancer. Uh, Brother Ben's mom with vertigo. Um, I added um, the, Mu the Munoz family to our prayer list last week. There's a, one of the players on, my, on Braden's football team. He lost his dad unexpectedly last week, about a week ago, a week or so ago. Um, and his mom said that he's taking it particularly hard, so let's continue to pray for them and their family. So that's the, the Munoz family. Um, and then anything else that I missed that we need to add to the prayer list or anyone else? All right. I'm sure there's still probably people are traveling, uh, still that time of year. Um, so let's keep that in mind as well. All right. <clears throat> With that being said, I'll go ahead and lead us in prayer. Father, thank you again for the blessings that you've given us for waking us up again, for sending rain on us um, so that the, the crops will grow and, uh, and that we would all have a source of food to eat. Thank you for giving us peace in this country. Um, and please be with those who are in places where there's not peace and there's war and there's turmoil and there's strife and there's food shortages and the prayer should be with, be with those people and provide for them as well. Please be with everyone who's on our prayer list. Please be with those who are grieving, loved ones, everyone who's battling cancer right now, who has other, anyone who has other health issues, um, those who are struggling in different ways, whether it's financially or emotionally, uh, especially those who are struggling spiritually. Pray that us, all of us as a body, that we will 
that we will be lights um, out in your world and that we will um, represent you and represent Christ in a way that brings glory to your name. Brother, I pray for us as we go through the study that the information that's presented will be uh, useful, that it'll make sense, that I'll present in a way uh, where it's any, easy to understand and easy to retain, and that we will all take any opportunity that we have uh, to share this information with others, as we know that most people won't have access and will never have a, may not have opportunity to hear this, uh, this type of information. Um, please be with us today as we study and as we worship. And thank you for your son who you sent to die in order that we could have forgiveness of sins. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> so get ready to answer some questions today. We are going to finish up on living fossils. Uh, there is another handout, Lesson 11 on Explosion. And I think uh, Brother Gene has those. So if you don't have one, then <clears throat> grab one of those. We may or may not get to it today. Uh, but just in case, so Lesson 11 on Explosion. But we're going to finish up lesson, lesson 10 today on living fossils. Um, <clears throat> and so, again, I'll go over this, the creation model versus the, the evolution model, as far as the origins of things. As far as biblical creationists, we believe that God created the various kinds of animals and plants during the creation week, so a literal six days, um, and rested on the seventh, and that these organisms have changed little over time. There has been change, but little changes. Um, so changes within a kind. So example would be wolves changing, uh, wolves turning into different uh, types of dogs. So they're still wolves, but you can speciate the dog kind out into different types of species. So you have your um, poodles and you have your Labradors and all of those. You can select whether artificial or um, natural selection, but they're all still they're still dogs, so they're still the same kind. Compare, uh, well, the reason why we believe that is due to what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis 1, and I pulled out a couple of verses, but um, we see that God created everything according to its kind. Um, so verse 11, uh, the herb, let's see, it says, let the, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yield seed and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to their kind whose seed is in itself on the earth. So we know apple trees um, put out seeds that produce other apple trees. Verse 21, so God created sea creatures and every living thing that moves in the waters. They abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And so things in the oceans and things that fly, they all reproduce according to their kind as well. And then 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things, beasts, of the earth, each according to its kind. So there are specific kinds of creatures that God has created, and they all reproduce after their kind. So things are not changing into different kinds of creatures. Um, everything is created according to its kind. Compare that with the evolution model, which says that all life evolved from a single living cell um, that was formed by chemicals about four and a half billion years or four billion years ago. And from that one single cell that arose from non-living things, um, which there's no explanation for how that happened, but there's a living cell, the first cell, and everything else is a descendant of that cell. So every, um, everything that has ever existed on this earth, whether plants or animals, insects, birds, fish, whatever it is, um, it all evolved from that same ancestor. There's a common ancestor um, for all things. And in this model, things do change into different kinds of creatures. So an example would be dinosaurs changing into birds or evolving into birds or mammals evolving into whales. So creatures go um, and they evolve into different kinds of creatures. And so <clears throat> that is a major difference. Um, there are some evolutionary mechanisms. There's three of them that we've talked about as far as how this happens. Um, so I'm starting with the questions here. Who remembers? There's three mechanisms that, according to the evolutionists, how one creature can change from one kind of something into something else. There's three things um, that drive evolution. Who remembers what those are? Take a look back at that other lesson 10 paper if you need to. Who remembers? Yeah. Yep, long periods of time, you've got to have long ages, enough time 
the general idea is give enough time, anything can happen. Um, natural selection, so an animal is adapting to their environments. So we see natural selection today, um, and we have no problem with that, what they call microevolution. I don't like the name, but we have no problem with that. We see animals change as they adapt in their environment and fill a niche in their environment, but they still say the same kind of animal. So again, I go back to Darwin's finches. Um, Darwin had, he saw that some finches had fat beaks, some had skinny beaks, some had long beaks, depending on what they ate. Um, and they adapted to their environment, but they were all still finches. But um, for the evolutionists, that is reason along with mutations for, um, <clears throat> along with those with mutations for an animal to change from one kind of animal to a different kind of, to a different kind of creature. Um, so I'm going to go through this. We talked about what mutations are last time, and then about genes and genetic variation. All right, so some more questions to help us review. Uh, living fossils is what we've been talking about for the last two class periods. Uh, who can remind us, what are living fossils? What are living fossils? Okay. This chair. All right, Brother Garrett. Yeah. Yeah, so living fossils are, are animals, they're organisms that we find in the fossil record, but they're still alive today. And when you look at what's in the fossil record and you look at what's still alive today, they're, they're basically unchanged, they're the same. They still look the same. Um, and so that's what living fossils are, um, organisms that have remained essentially unchanged from earlier geologic, geologic times. Um, is there only a few, are there only a few examples of living fossils? No, there's many of them. There's many of them. So it's not just one particular animal. There's plants, there's birds, there's reptiles, there's sea creatures, there's insects. There's all kinds of things that are living fossils, things that you see in the fossil record. And then when you, uh, and then when you look at them today, they're still alive and they're unchanged. So essentially, anything that's in the fossil record that's not extinct is a living fossil, and when you look at them, they, they remain the same. They still look the same as what they were. Okay, so what's the significance about that? Part, the second question, why are living fossils significant when it comes to this debate about creation and evolution? What's the significance of those? What do they show us? Yeah. Right, exactly. So the, the significance is there's no change. There's no change between then and now, even though some of these living fossils are supposed to be uh, hundreds of millions of years old. Um, and so for something that's extinct and it's not around anymore, you can make up any story you want to about that. But if there's something that's in the fossil record that's still alive, you can't make up stories for those. Um, and so there's living fossils that are around and the significance is that they show us that things did not evolve. So if the earth is billions of years old and that the rocks are the ages that they say, then that means that things didn't evolve over that time period, whether it's 100 million years, 50 million years, 200 million years, that they didn't evolve during that time period. So it shows that things didn't evolve um, or it shows that the earth really isn't as old as they say it is or it proves both, it shows both. But those are the only explanations as to why you can have fossils that are, um, that are animals in the fossil record that still appear the same today, even though they show up in rock that's supposed to be millions of years old. Okay, so we watched a couple of videos on those. We will, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll watch this. We'll watch this one again, let's see. Scientists studying fossil sea spiders from Jurassic Rock found they are just the same as today's sea spiders. By evolutionary reckoning, that's no change in 160 million years. In that supposed time, evolutionists say, most of the dinosaurs, birds, many fish and virtually all mammals have evolved, all by natural processes. From finches to albatrosses and mice to elephants, they all made themselves by evolutionary processes. They also say that most of the flowering plants evolved too, and yet the sea spiders haven't changed in all that 
time. Curious, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created plants to produce seed according to each kind created, and He created sea life and creeping things after their kind also. This is the most established principle of biology, that living things produce offspring like themselves. These sea spiders illustrate this biblical truth. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our okay, website. So- Cre- with this, we see that um, in that period of time, 160 millions of years, supposedly all of the dinosaurs evolved. So spiders, they stayed the same, the ones that we see in the fossil record and they, we see them now. But every dinosaur evolved during that time and virtually every mammal evolved during that time and all the birds evolved during that time period. Um, some of the fish evolved during that time period. All the flowering plants evolved during that time period so we have all this change but yet we have things that from that time period that are still alive that um, are supposed to have uh, that didn't evolve even though they're supposed to be that such period long periods of time and so we went over several examples lots of examples of living fossils crocodiles are supposed to be 140 million years old you don't see any change in them you see uh, tuatara lizards in the fossil record they're supposed to be 200 million years old um, you don't see any change in those. Ginkgo trees, <clears throat> so not just reptiles. Ginkgo trees, 125 million years old, no change. We see the leaves look exactly the same now as they did, um, I suppose, 125 million years ago. We've got horseshoe crabs, they're 200 million years old. Um, you can go and see these at the aquarium down in Newport. Go in there and touch them in the little petting area. Um, they're supposed to be 200 million years old, but you see that they're still the same as they were in the fossil record. Uh, We have trees, Willamette Pine, so this was supposed to be extinct, at least they thought it was, um, about 150 million years ago because that's the last time it shows up in the rock um, in the fossil record uh, due to their dating methods. Um, However, it's turned up in Australia and we see that there's no change over that 150 million years. Um, Insects as well, so frog hoppers, here's an example. Uh, this example shows us a couple of things. First, that there's rapid burial, which we've talked about before, so things aren't laying around, slowly being covered with sediment over millions of years to fossilize. This had to be quick because they're in the position, um, in the mating position, so it had to be fast. Um, it shows us that they haven't changed. The morphology is the same. They still look the same. And it also tells us that, the, that their behaviors haven't evolved either over 165 million years if they really were that old, their behaviors didn't evolve, um, which is a problem because over that time period, um, <clears throat> not only should they be evolving, but the predators that prey on them would be evolving, which would also form them, or cause them to have to evolve to, to survive because the predators are evolving. And so this, we see that their behaviors stay the same, which is another big um, problem for them. So. Uh, what's the big deal? The big deal is the change. There's lack of change um, that we see for anything that's still alive that's in the fossil record. We don't see any change in it. Um, <clears throat> which again, for anything that's not alive, anything that's extinct in the fossil record, you can come up with any story you want to for that and um, it's more difficult to prove otherwise. Okay, so evolutionists are aware of this. Here's Stephen Jay Gould. He was a kind of a famous guy. He says the maintenance of stability within species must be considered a major evolutionary problem. So he admits it, that it's a problem that these organisms are not changing um, anything that you see in the fossil record that's still alive, they're, they're virtually unchanged. And so that is a problem. Okay, here's the next question though. How do they try and explain this? How do they try to explain away these living fossils? How do they explain those? This is a little bit more complex of a question. Go ahead, brother. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So one of the ways one of the ways that they say that that these animals didn't change is because they are so well adapted to their environment, whatever that environment is, that they didn't need to evolve or that branches evolved from them. But those branches died off because they weren't as well adapted to the environment as the original branch, um, which would beg the question, why would it anything evolve from it to begin with if it wasn't as well adapted to the environment? But they will say that, um, you know, that everything is so well adapted, these were so well adapted that they didn't need to evolve. And so I'll just read the underlying part 
for this quote <clears throat> says the theory of evolution explains how species change over time it doesn't say that all species must change over time as long as the species can survive in its environment and pass on its genetic information to its offspring it can it can survive indefinitely um, and so and then the question is asked so how exactly does that not work with evolution the way that this doesn't work with evolution is you got to keep the change you can't just change whenever you want to and then say it doesn't change whenever you don't want it to you got to keep the change and so what they do is they come up with these what's called rescue hypotheses um, to to try and save the theory and so one of these rescue hypotheses is called evolutionary stasis um, which is really an oxymoron because evolution means things changing and stasis means staying the same so evolutionary stasis um, <clears throat> but um, so again to kind of explain what that is uh, I'll read the underlying part it says well I'll read it all said yes I believe that animals have changed greatly over time so I believe in evolution but some animals and plants were so well adapted to the environment that they did not need to change so I'm not bothered at all by these living fossils and so that's what evolutionary stasis means that's what the term means that there's fossils that uh, there are organisms that stay the same um, instead of evolving so we have that kind of uh, that oxymoron the bittersweet type of uh, uh, hypothesis here this rescue hypothesis so we'll um, um, we'll watch this quick video as well in nature documentaries and science textbooks, one often hears about creatures that arrived at their body plan very early in evolutionary history and have not made any real changes since that time, supposedly millions of years ago. These are called living fossils, like the coelacanth and the Walmy pine. This phenomenon is known as stasis, things staying pretty much the same. And it turns out that pretty much every animal in the entire fossil record appears suddenly and shows this same history of stasis. This was not predicted by evolution. A more recent and radical theory called punctuated equilibrium recognizes stasis in the fossil record but requires belief in rapid massive leaps in evolution, an unsubstantiated just so story. However, the physical evidence, sudden appearance and stasis in the fossil record fits remarkably well with the biblical account of a recent creation followed by a devastating global flood, just as the Bible describes in Genesis. To find out more from Creation Ministries International. Okay, so that was just a quick video on stasis. Um, and in kind of an explanation. However, there are some problems with evolutionary stasis <clears throat> that you can't get away with, you can't get around. Uh, first off, it's a hypothesis that's it's, it's really self-refuting, okay? So you can't, on one hand, say all things change, and then on the other hand, say, but sometimes they don't change. That's like saying um, cats are not dogs, but sometimes dogs are cats. You can't, can't have it both ways. Um, so it's got to be one or the other. Second part is that in order for this to be true, um, then you would have to assume that these environments didn't change at all over these time periods, whether it's 100 million years, 200 million years, 500 million years. You got to assume that these environments didn't change. If you're going to say that the animal was so well adapted to its environment that it didn't have to change, you got to assume that these, these um, didn't change. And then you still have the problem of mutations that go along with that. Okay, so... This is um, one flexible theory. Um, whenever you can have a hypothesis added to that theory, that's the exact opposite of what the actual theory says. If you can incorporate a, a antithesis into your theory, then that means that that's really not science if, you're, if your hypothesis within the theory is the exact opposite. All right, so next question here. <clears throat> what are some problems with assuming that environments don't change? How, do, how, how does that not work? especially given their own story. So that, at this point, evolution becomes its own worst enemy. Um, so what's the problem with assuming that environments don't change or with, that they didn't change, even according to the evolutionary story? Who's got, who remembers anything from that? It's kind of where we ended up last time. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So according to the, the, the whole theory that is these environmental changes that 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 drive change. And so if the environments weren't changing, then how is anything else evolving? Um, because it's the environmental change itself that 
causes things to be selected for or selected against that causes the evolution. Okay, so if environments aren't changing, then why is anything else evolving? Um, <clears throat> so that is good. That's a good point. That's another one of those uh, things that, that go against this. Um, but again, we go back to the mechanisms. So long ages of time, natural selection, which is adapting to an environment, and mutations. Okay, so <clears throat> environments staying the same. That is a big question mark here. Um, but again, as I said before, evolution becomes its own worst enemy once we talk about, uh, try, try to start saying that environments stay the same. Because according to the tale in the four and a half billion years that the earth has been around, um, as uh, Rajesh was saying, it's the environment that drives all the change for evolution. <clears throat> but during that time, so the reason that why we have this such a diversity of species and dif different things evolving, um, there have been multiple global catastrophes that have been changing the environment. So organisms are having to change to, to fit different environments. Of course, none of those have been a global flood like what's in Genesis. But there's been multiple global catastrophes. There's been no less than five different extinction level events that have occurred in Earth's history um, in the four and a half billion years. How can you have an extinction level event without environments changing? Uh, much less five of them without environments changing that these organisms can stay in and, uh, and not have to evolve over those long periods of time. There's been multiple ice ages. There's been about five ice ages in their story. Um, how can you have these ice ages without environments changing? Okay, so if you have ice ages, that means ocean levels are going to be uh, declining. So there's going to be fluctuation in, uh, in oceans. Um, <clears throat> fluctuations in the basic overall global temperature. So all these environments are going to be changing if this stuff is, is really going on. And then what about the predators? Predators are evolving. They're getting better at feeding on prey. That's how supposedly how they're evolving. So the prey has to evolve to better evade the predators. And so how is that going to, uh, how's that, um, how's that going to work if these organisms are staying the same for hundreds of millions of years? Um, without having to evolve to better evade things that are going to be preying on them. And then again, this is in all aspects of life, the whole spectrum of life we see living fossils in. So if, let's say, it was just uh, one living fossil that we could find, or maybe five living fossils, but they're all just ocean creatures, then you, maybe you could say, okay, so everything else was changing, but the oceans remain pretty much the same. But that's not what it is. There's living fossils for reptiles, for mammals, um, for birds, for marine life, for insects. There's living fossils for all different walks of life. <clears throat> in addition to all the stuff that we just mentioned, according to that, the Earth has been rearranging itself. So this is just from the Permian period, 225 million years ago. But again, according to their story, Earth is four and a half billion years old. So the continents. Uh, are going to be constantly rearranging into different, uh, different positions. Um, and so, how can you say the environments are going to stay the same? The latitudes and the long longitudes are changing, the oceans are changing, the seas are changing as we see these continents moving into different places. So, the Permian time period is supposed to be Pangaea, kind of the supercontinent. And again, there's a lot of stuff before this. I only went back to 225 million years ago. Um, the Triassic after that, and then starting to break up into uh, Laurasia and Gond Gondwana land. And then you get to the Jurassic, and you see things are changing more, different latitudes and longitudes. And then the Cretaceous, we see more different latitudes and longitudes. And then now, um, this is present day. <clears throat> and, so, um, and so the Earth is changing, the continents are moving, the oceans are changing, the sea level is rising and falling. Um, you're having these ice ages that are occurring throughout the history, four and a half billion year history of the Earth, and yet we're going to say that the that organism was so well adapted to its environment that it didn't have to change. It doesn't make much sense, and not just one ice age again. So here's five of them uh, that they have identified as different ice ages at different points of time. These last three right here um, being after. Um, the Cambrian explosion and so um, so if you want to talk about these organisms being so well adapted then they had to 
have to adapt it to, uh, to three different ice ages. And these ranging in time from 30 million years uh, to 100 million years, uh, the, the length, the duration of these ice ages that have occurred in their own story. And then again, here are these mass extinctions that I talked about, um, extinction level events. There's supposed to be one at the end of the Ordovician, one late Devonian, one at the end of the Permian in Triassic, and then here's this KT extinction that's supposed to kill off all the dinosaurs. So we have all these extinction level events, all these ice ages, all these continents rearranging, ocean levels rising and falling, and yet we're going to say that the environment stayed the same, and so these animals were so well adapted that they didn't have to change. All right, so that doesn't make any sense, um, and it, it, it just doesn't work. And again, another big point of that, is that it's all spectrums of life, all spectrums of life. We can't just say, oh, well, it's just the, the sea creatures that are the only things that are living fossils, so therefore the seas must have stayed the same. Nope, got plants that stayed the same over 100, 200 million years. We got birds that have stayed the same. We got reptiles that have stayed the same for hundreds of millions of years. Insects and sea creatures. Um, and again, so like I said before, you can make up any story you want to for stuff that's extinct. Um, coelacanth, this is a good example. So the coelacanth, they thought it was extinct, and we see these big flippers, these strong flippers that it has, and they, they made up the story. Well, this is one of those forms of creatures that were evolving to crawl out of the water and crawl onto land because it, it has these big strong flippers, and they said it used to use them to kind of crawl around on the ocean floor, and they were starting to evolve in order to come out on the land. Um, but then we found these, uh, discovered them to be alive. Uh, they caught some off of, the, off of the coast of Australia, I think. And they found some in some other places. Uh, but they study them and they see that, that they do no, no such thing. They swim around just like regular fish do. Um, and so, um, again, it's easy to make up stories about extinct stuff. But that's not science. That's storytelling. That's historical science. You're trying to Put, put puzzle pieces together, but when we're doing actual operational science, we see that it just doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> not only that, but there are all these examples that we've seen, but um, we'll go ahead and watch this video as well. Stromatolites many as the oldest fossils on Earth. They are interpreted as the remains of colonies of blue-green algae, or more accurately, cyanobacteria. The oldest ones are claimed to be 3.5 billion years old. Within this evolutionary perspective, one would expect these colonies to have radically changed, but remarkably, they are essentially the same today. Stromatolites, therefore, are classic examples of living fossils. Living fossils cause major problems for evolution because they provide stunning examples of how evolution hasn't occurred. They also call into question the evolutionary time frame. Some people try to downplay the significance of living fossils by arguing that when something is well adapted to its environment, it doesn't need to change. But this this would need the environment to be constant for the supposed period of time. This argument cannot apply to stromatolites because during 3.5 billion years of alleged evolutionary time, many radical environment changes supposedly occurred, including the arrival of new predators and parasites. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website okay. creation.com. <clears throat> so again, as if, um, you know, the hundreds of millions of years of living fossils that didn't change as if that wasn't bad enough, we have these stromatolites that are supposed to be three and a half billion years old, and they're the same. They haven't changed. All right, so, and again, with all the stuff we talked about, the, the sea levels rising and falling and extinction level events and all that, uh, there's no way that something could be three and a half billion years old and not change. <clears throat> again, with predators, parasites, and other things added to the equation. But, <clears throat> so this is where we ended off last time. But for the sake of argument, let's just say that the environment did stay the same. Some, some miracle, even though uh, we, don't, we can't have supernatural things. But uh, let's say that some, somehow the environment didn't change. Just, we'll just go with that, just for the sake of argument. argument. Um, <clears throat> could this still be a possibility? Could things still have not evolved over that amount of time period? Okay, so here's kind of the, the last question which we're going to talk about right now. So even if the environment stayed the same, why is evolutionary stasis, why is that still impossible? Okay, so again, evolution is its own worst story. Those three things, worst enemy, those three things we talked about, long periods of time, 
natural selection, so adapting to its environment. So we're just going to say for the sake of argument, it doesn't have to adapt anymore. That environment stayed the same for billions of years. Um, you still have a problem because of this. That third thing that they say is what drives evolution. Mutations. Can't get away from them. All right, so what about mutations? <clears throat> So we talked about last time what mutations are. They're going to be codes. They're, they're changes in, in DNA. They're changes in DNA. And there are random things that happen um, as copying mistakes and things occur when DNA is, is, uh, is copied. Um, but all organisms undergo mutations. All of them do. Um, and again, they're just accidental changes. <clears throat> there is no mechanism that can prevent mutations from occurring. So all organisms, organisms undergo mutations. There is no mechanisms. And so organisms cannot possibly remain unchanged for hundreds of millions of years if they really were around for that amount of time. They can't remain unchanged for hundreds of millions of years because those mutations will add up. Those mutations will add up. <clears throat> all right, so this is why they add up. Mutations are generational. They're generational. So you are more mutant than your parents are. And your parents are more mutant than their parents were. Okay? Your kids are more mutant than you are. Okay? You are more of a mutant. Mutations. They add up. They're generational. So humans, it's been measured that we accumulate about 60-ish mutations per generation, give or take some but about 60 mutations per generation. <clears throat> um, anywhere between 60 and 100 mutations per generation. Okay, so again, there's no, uh, there's, it's, it's a generational thing. It's something that is gonna happen, and it is not optional. You cannot say, well, these organisms, they didn't mutate either over these hundreds of millions of years, or these three and a half billions of years. They're not optional. The reason they're not optional is because God made it not optional. Mutations are a result of the curse. When Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed his creation. And mutations are a part of that. <clears throat> and we read about this in Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 22. It says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, so it's not an option, but because of him who subjected it, and hope. Why was creation subjected to futility? It's because of Adam and Eve and when God creates his, his creation. Okay, it says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption. So it's corrupting, it's decaying, it's, the, it's what we see, it's entropy, it's laws of nature, everything winds down. We know that this is occurring. And why it's occurring is because God made it so. He created everything very good and then he cursed it after Adam and Eve sin, and he's going to redeem it from that curse um, when there's the new, uh, when he provides new heaven and new earth. But it says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together un until now. All of the creation. So you not everything that's evolved is mutating and the other stuff didn't. All of creation is subjected to mutations. It's all winding down. It's all wearing out like a garment, which it says uh, elsewhere in the Bible. Okay, <clears throat> so mutations are not optional. So even for the sake of argument, we said that these environments did stay the same for these hundreds of millions and billions of years. You still can't get away from the fact that there is mutations are still occurring and they're generational they accumulate by generation okay a lot of these organisms are going to reproduce um, a lot more frequently than humans do such as bacteria they, re they reproduce very quickly um, and so here's another example of this lingula lamp shell it's supposed to be 450 million years old and it's still the same if it were really that old, it would be so mutant because there have been so many generations that have occurred that the thing wouldn't even be recognizable anymore. And again, it goes all back to their story. It's its, its own worst enemy. So they know that mutations occur. 
and that they can't be changed. And they say that mutations along with natural selection is what drives this evolution, which is what causes everything to evolve. But then you can't go back and say things don't change if everything is mutating and mutations are not optional. Okay, so if this was really 450 million years old, as is, they say, and as is shown in the fossil record due to their dating methods, then there is no way that this thing would even be recognizable because it'd be so mutant at this point that there would be nothing to recognize as far as this goes. And not only that, so it gets worse again. So we have this mollusk right here. It's about 500, supposedly 500 million years old. Um, but again, in this amount of time, these creatures, they would be so mutant that they could not survive in, in any environment, really, um, much less the environment that has been unchanged over these 500 million years old, uh, these 500 million years. Uh, but we look at them in the fossil record and we look at them alive today and we realize that they are still unchanged. There's nothing different about them. Um, <clears throat> they're virtually the same as what you find in the fossil record. Okay, so this is just, um, it, it becomes kind of a, one of those tall tales. It's a, it's a whopper of a story. Uh, I, my expression is kind of like this baby's on this picture right here when somebody uh, is going to tell me that there's been 500 million years of stasis without anything, anything changing. Okay, so I'll just read this slide. It says, in that alleged time frame, evolution by mutations and natural selections has supposedly changed some identified worm into all of the fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, all of that is, has occurred. So there was, there's supposed to be nothing essentially at that point and all of the life that's evolved on this planet has occurred in that period of time, yet this, this shell, it stayed the same. It didn't evolve at all during that time period. Okay, so uh, unbelievable. It's senseless. It doesn't make sense. Um, and at the same time, all the land plants has supposedly evolved too. So not just the, 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 the animals and insects and all that stuff, but all the plants, all the land plants has supposedly evolved during that time period as well. Yet we see that this shell right here is still the same and all of life evolved, but this shell didn't. Um, it's senseless, it doesn't make any sense. But then that goes back to <clears throat> what we've talked about before. Here's this quote again from Richard Lewinton, and we keep coming back to this because it's, it's very significant because evolution portrays itself as being science, but what it really is when you take a deep look at it, it's, it's a worldview, it's a philosophy, and it's in itself, for some, it is a religion itself. Um, and again, we're not painting all evolutionists with, with a, a broad brush here, however, the people who are out in the field and who are researching this stuff and who are writing these textbooks, they know this. This isn't, like, this isn't secret information. They know this stuff, but they continue to, to portray evolution in textbooks and on TV shows and in movies and all that stuff as absolute truth when they know that all of this stuff doesn't add up and, it, and, and disproves it, um, in effect disproves it. But this is, this is why, as far as these researchers go, um, it says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense, so it's against common sense, they know it doesn't make sense, we can't say that all life on this whole planet evolved during this time period, but this show didn't change at all. Um, so it, it's, it goes against common sense. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to understanding the real struggle between science and supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. So he knows that some of the stuff they say is absurd when you look into it. It's absurd. Um, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Okay, so no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. So there's a commitment to materialism which rejects anything supernatural. So if it's not material, if you can't touch it, feel it, see it, you can't experiment with it, then it's not real um, and it doesn't exist. So anything else is ruled out. <clears throat> and they have this commitment to materialism, which allows them or which causes them to not take a good look 
at what's right in front of them and go with, with the evidence. It's commitment and becomes basically a religion. Okay. Moreover, down at the bottom, moreover, that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So that's what it's all about. It's all about denying the existence of God and making sure that, um, that science can, can perform without God. Um, and so I'll end with this, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is calling. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We are Christ's, Christ's ambassadors. Okay, so that's the reason why one of the goals for this class was to, to be able to teach others. The people, the general, your neighbors, the people you work with, um, your family members, they don't, they don't know this. All they know is what's being presented to them, what's being portrayed in the media, on TV, on the internet, in the textbooks, by their science teachers. That's all they know. We have to be Christ ambassadors. We have to, we have to spread the word um, and, and teach people the difference between what's being told and, and what's reality. All right. Thank you for your attention.